we're going to talk about the neutron and an atom's identity. Then we're gonna talk a little about the periodic table and see what we just learned about the neutron in the periodic table. Lastly, we're gonna talk about how electrons give the structure to the periodic table. And then we're gonna move on. Here we are. Here is one of the most useful things that you can look at when looking at atoms. It's called the band of stability for neutrons. This is amazing. I've made it sound like adding or subtracting a neutron doesn't change an atom's identity. And in one way, this is completely untrue in the sense that technically, if you have, you could have different forms of the same atom. Those are called isotopes of the same atom. And that depends on how many neutrons are in the atom. Because if you have a gold atom that has a set amount of protons, but it doesn't have a set amount of neutrons, there's a range of neutrons that it could have. And every single different version with a different amount of neutrons will be a different isotope. But is it unlimited? Can you just have neutrons galore? No, you can't. And that's what this band of stability shows us. It shows us that the most stable form of an atom is the one that matches that black line. So the number of protons are running along the bottom, the number of neutrons along the vertical axis. What you see here is that there's no neat line of an equal amount of protons and an equal amount of neutrons to make a given atom. In fact, as you build bigger atoms, you have more and more neutrons naturally. If we look, zone in on 50, so 50 protons on the bottom. If you look, the most stable form for 50 protons is roughly like 63 over there or something like that, but more neutrons than protons and also could have more or less neutrons. It could have, it seems, up to a little more than 82 neutrons and a little less than or just about 50 neutrons. This brings us to the second way in which neutrons actually do change the identity of atoms. This way isn't mere isotopes. This is literally changing the type of element that the atom is. When you add enough neutrons that it reaches that blue area, it's not a stable element anymore. It's not a stable atom anymore, and eventually it will decay with a form of decay called beta minus decay. And what beta minus decay means is that you're going to have a neutron in the nucleus, and it's going to emit an electron and an anti-electron neutrino. And by doing that, by losing that negative charge, it's going to become a proton. And suddenly you have another proton in this atom, and the atom goes up from whatever it was to the next atom. That's how neutrons can change an element's identity. Now, let's take a look at the periodic table to see this reality of different neutron numbers. When you look at any given box on the periodic table, over here you see the atomic number in the upper left for hydrogen 1, for helium 2, for fluorine 9, for oxygen 8. But if you look at the bottom of the box, you see a larger number. So, for example, if you look at carbon, carbon has 6 protons, but it has 12.01 neutrons. So what does that mean? It means that usually carbon will have six neutrons, and that adds from the six protons plus six neutrons, that's 12. But what's that 0.01? Because sometimes carbon will come with more neutrons. Sometimes it will come with seven neutrons. That's carbon 13, or eight neutrons, carbon 14. And because a very, very small percentage of carbon atoms come in these higher forms, the average weight is actually 12.01. And of course, that's not to suggest that there's a partial particle over here. Now we've seen a little deeper into neutrons, how neutrons can change the identity of an atom in various ways. We still don't really know why the periodic table begins and stops where it does. We know that progressively it's getting more and more protons and changing atomic type, but why start with hydrogen and end with helium for the first row? And for the second row, why start with lithium and end with neon and correspondingly sodium, argon, potassium, krypton, and so on? There's actually a pretty basic rule going on here. And what determines when a row ends and a new one begins isn't about protons or neutrons. It's completely about the electron. When a valence shell of an electron is full, it makes the atom unreactive. So when you move from the left to the right on the table, you're moving from a very empty valence shell, in fact, a valence shell with just one electron, and then moving to the right, you have it filling out that valence shell. So hydrogen has one electron in its valence shell, helium has two, and that valence shell could only take two, so it's full. Lithium has one, beryllium has two, boron has three, carbon has four, nitrogen five, oxygen six, fluorine seven, neon eight, and eight fills out that valence shell. So you got the idea of what's happening here. You're going to have the most reactive, the most willing to give up an electron element on the far left, but they're there because they're just number one. They're the first electron 
in that new valence shell that that row is starting. We now have a sense of what an atom is, what makes an atom an atom of a certain type, and what the basic story of the periodic table is. But when we think about atoms, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons, but only the electron is a fundamental particle. It's the only thing that if you cut it, you don't end up with two different particles or more than two different particles. The same cannot be said for protons and neutrons. On the contrary, protons and neutrons are each made up of three distinct particles, namely quarks. And we're going to look at all of these subatomic particles, these fundamental particles, in the next video. So check that out if you want to go deeper.